Thank you. Thank you for coming to my talk. Um, I'm going to kind of give a broad overview of my work in conservation psychology and talk about how it can intersect with innovations that arise from computing. Um, and I'll talk in detail about one project just because of our limited time here, just to give you kind of a concrete sample of the work that we do in my group. So here's the problem. Environmental problems stem from and are maintained by human choices and behavior. We are consumers. We drive demand for resources, causing resource extraction, habitat destruction, uh, pollution. And this is no good for other species as well as ourselves. Uh, the situation pains me to no end, and here's why. I'm a psychologist. I study people. I like people, but I don't like a lot of the things that we're doing to the planet. Luckily, psychology is also well equipped to address uh, aspects of a lot of these problems, and so that's what underlies uh, my work. And the central question that I seek to answer is how can we encourage people to behave pro-environmentally? So hopefully we'll provide some answers to Biplav's question. So if environmental problems are stemming from us, can't we just change ourselves? Well, decades of behavioral research has shown that we can change ourselves. We have shown that we can increase people's exercise habits and we can get people to decrease the amount of energy that they use in their homes. But it's often not that simple because the value of status quo often outweighs the value of change. And anyone who's ever tried to lose weight can <laughs> identify with this guy. <laughs> you know the value of resisting the donuts, but when you're sitting there staring at them and they look delicious, sometimes the desire to devour them is overpowering. And so while your heart's in the right place, it doesn't always translate to change. And there's this gap or disparity between knowing that you need to change and not actually following through with it. So at the same time, we are in the technological age. Technology is here. So can't we leverage these new technologies, many of which we're discussing today in the other sessions, for sustainability? We can and we are, as shown by wind power, solar power, electric cars, and just focusing on renewables for a moment, global investment in renewables has risen dramatically in recent years, and it's predicted to continue rising in coming decades. The problem here is that we're the people. How do we know this is going to happen, and how will people interact with these technologies? So returning to our question, how do we encourage people to behave pro-environmentally? What are our options? We can try to change people, rely on technology to fix things, we could think outside the box, maybe try to colonize Mars. Didn't really work out for Matt Damon, so I'm not sure that we could hack it. Um, or what I'll propose is that we integrate behavioral approaches with new technologies, and that alone, neither of these solutions is as good as they are in partnership. So the research objectives that we explore in my group, uh, one, are understanding decision-making around technology adoption and resource use. Then developing and testing interventions des designed to promote sustainable behaviors. How do we get people to change? And most importantly, uncovering processes of behavior change. And I'll talk about why that's important here. So we have one group of researchers in psychology that look at modeling decision making, so understanding how decisions are made. We have another group who does the intervention work, so trying to get people to actually make changes. But these groups don't necessarily talk, so we don't understand what changes occur as part of an intervention. What we really want to know is why the interventions work, how decisions and behaviors change during these interventions, how long changes persist, and what particular behaviors are actually changing during the interventions. Only by knowing what happens inside this black box do we know what the motivators are, how to target them specifically, uh, and how we can streamline interventions and allocate resources more efficiently in the future. And we explore these questions in my group as applied to a whole host of different topics in sustainability, ranging from how do you optimally communicate about climate change in order to spur action, to how do you get people to adopt electric cars, to what happens when you implement a composting program and then it results in positive spillover, which is uh, positive behaviors in other environmental uh, sectors, such as energy and water conservation. Can't go into all of them with our limited time, so I'm going to focus for our C4 purposes on wildlife security. And I want us to keep in mind that wildlife crime stems from and is maintained by our choices and behavior. Humans are causing demand for these products, whether it be using rhino horn for medicinal purposes to getting tigers for rugs, to actually poaching the animals and killing them. 
and we know that this is resulting in devastating effects on the species populations. And this graph on the left is showing numbers of South African rhinos poached over the past decade, which has risen dramatically. The graph on the right is showing the uh, plummeting numbers of the global tiger population from the turn of the 20th century till today. So we really need to understand what are the drivers of demand, poaching, and trafficking. And we really need to focus on this triad that humans are involved in. I'm going to focus on poaching for the rest of the talk, but we want to keep in mind that all three of these elements are important uh, as we think about combating wildlife crime. So combating poaching is one of several global security challenges. We've got to protect critical infrastructure such as ports, trains, and airports. We've got to protect critical resource resources such as wildlife and fisheries. The problem is that we have limited security resources and vast areas to protect with many targets. So how do we optimize our security resource allocation? Well, in Malin's group, they've been very successful at developing game theory-based decision aids in order to solve this problem. Um, so for example, uh, decision aids have been developed to protect ports using the US Coast Guard as a partner. Um, there have also been decision aids developed to schedule federal air marshals on flights. And when we think about green security games, uh, decision aids have been developed to protect fisheries from illegal fishing, as well as terrestrial wildlife from poaching. And this is the work that you've heard about from Faye, Debaroon, Ben, and Fine, who's not here, uh, which is PAWS, the software that optimizes ranger patrols by predicting poacher behavior. At the same time, there are a number of practical challenges in wildlife security. There are a lot of them. I can't get into all of them. Um, but one of them involved in combating poaching is this idea of using new technologies. So there are technologies that are in use now, SMART, um, for instance, which collects data on what has happened. So where have signs of poaching been observed? Where have we seen animals, terrain data, et cetera? The problem or the limitation here is they look backward in time. What we really want to know is where poachers are going to go so we can stay ahead of them. And this is a gap that PAWS can really fill. By taking advantage of SMART data and feeding it into the PAWS system, uh, it can connect really well and be able to stay one step ahead of the poachers by predicting their behavior. So we kind of have this research practice gap where on the research end, what we really want to do is test and deploy these new technologies in the real world. And we have done that uh, as denoted by the icons on this map, which show where the game theoretic decision aids in Mullen's group have been deployed in the real world. We're always looking for new security challenges and new real world settings in which to test them. It requires partnering with security agencies as Debrun and Ben mentioned earlier. And on the practical end, uh, in the wildlife domain, it would be really useful to get predictive technologies to know where poachers are going. So how do we bridge this gap for the researchers to move beyond the lab into the field? Well, what we did is we developed a systematic approach to facilitate the transition of PAWS to the real world. And it starts with establishing a partnership with an NGO or other organization, moves on to educating key decision makers and users of the new technology in the software. Hopefully that spurs technology adoption to enable field testing and deployment, which is the ultimate goal. And what I focused on in, in the project I'll talk about is the education piece. And the concept here is that a lot of the, uh, the underlying theoretical framework of PAWS is really complex. I'm a psychologist, not a computer scientist, so it took me a lot of time to get up to speed on the very complex concepts that are involved. And so the idea is to make these accessible uh, to the people that are going to be using the technologies in the field so that they can understand how this tool can be useful to them. They want to know how it's going to work, that it's going to be efficacious for their application. And this idea of increasing perceived usefulness is part of an established model called the technology acceptance model. So what we did, uh, which Debrun kind of briefly went over, is we developed a new education program uh, around a game to facilitate technology transition. And we deployed this workshop, which was called the PAWS workshop, done in conjunction with the WWF uh, in Indonesia with 29 Rangers last May. Uh, there were three components to the workshop. First was didactic instruction, where we had lectures on various topics such as agent-based modeling, as well as game theory, security games. 
We provided a lot of opportunities for peer-to-peer -peer interactions where the participants got into groups and discussed various challenges in wildlife security, had opportunities to teach and learn from one another. And then kind of the main feature was these games, uh, which included both computer and board games. And the participants played as both the defender and the adversary. Um, here's the game, which everyone already went over, so I won't go over it in detail. Um, but what they're trying to do uh, as the poacher is optimize their reward, which is represented by the hippos, while trying to avoid being caught, which is represented by the shading uh, of the heat map, uh, which is ranger coverage. So they can explore this, and they click on a cell, and they can get information about it, which is immediate quantitative feedback on the decision that they're going to make. Uh, then they can decide where they're going to attack. And again, they get this immediate feedback so they can learn what happens when they make various decisions in the poacher role. Now we adapted this and did the board games as well and the rangers split up into different groups and one group would play as the rangers and they would allocate uh, a security strategy to the board game um, and then the other group would play as poachers and try to outsmart the ranger team and they would go in rounds. They did five rounds of this. So they got experience learning how the other team would react to their strategy. And so after we conducted this study, we did a survey, um, and we found very high levels of engagement amongst the participants, which is good. Uh, we also assessed the perceived usefulness of PAUSE, which was our, our key prediction. Uh, we wanted to have this uh, looking like this, basically, all above the neutral point. And the intentions to adopt PAUSE were also very high. Now we put this to the test in the technology acceptance model uh, and we did find that this model was supported, which is great because this model has not been applied to law enforcement, definitely not anything related to wildlife security. Uh, and we see this very strong path between perceived usefulness and pause adoption intentions, which lends further support to our hypothesis that that's a key pathway through which this program, the educational program, can work. And we also looked at program engagement. So you know, if they like the program, that's probably going to lead to increased likelihood of adoption as well, which we found that path. But this is entirely mediated through perceived usefulness, or excuse me, not entirely mediated, but about half of the relationship is mediated. So again, it just shows the very strong role of usefulness in the sort of educational program to increase technology adoption. So I'll stop there. Uh, conclusions from uh, this work. We developed this approach to systematically facilitate trans technology transition from the lab to the field um, using this educational program that can be scaled and replicated in a number of different contexts and we're really interested in talking to anyone who might want to partner with us and work with this model and adapt it for other purposes. We understand how to change decision making uh, in this project and that is through enhancing perceived usefulness to foster technology adoption. Uh, additionally, we've learned that uh, teaching these artificial intelligence concepts can enhance willingness to adopt artificial intelligence-based technology. So if you give people the tools to understand how these things work, in fact, they're more likely to adopt it. Uh, and if these new tools outperform what's going on, what the status quo is for these security agencies, it's you know, a real possibility for strengthening wildlife security overall. And finally, I'll end with saying we need to consider the human element. Um, there is, you know, a lot of talks going on today where we kind of brush up against uh, what the human, how the human is involved, but I think that, you know, considering them as a more central feature is going to be really important as we move forward. So I'd like to end by also thanking, thanking my collaborators and students who worked on these projects, as well as funders, and I'm happy to take any questions. or disincentivizing the, the, uh, the, these decisions to prevent crime or to, to predict where, where poaching is going to happen. Um, do you see sort of even more merging of sort of the psychological um, 
modeling, qualitative modeling, and the quantitative computational modeling, and sort of doing it jointly and iteratively. Yes, absolutely. So if I'm understanding correctly, asking uh, is modeling human decision making, could it be part of you know, other pieces of developing these technologies? Right, and also uh, eliciting uh, the sort of the, the implicit costs and benefits that humans have ah. as part of these, this model. So, okay, so yes, what, what are the actual motivators and incentives and disincentives? Yes, absolutely, I think that it's key to really understand whoever your target audience is and to do some kind of assessment, whether it be interviews or surveys or a workshop or a prior literature review even, to see what is it that's important and motivating to them so that you can build that into whatever your model is. Because oftentimes it's not as simple as just mere economics and cost and reward. You need to think about breaking down those costs and rewards and understanding what really goes into them for a particular target audience. A quick question about uh, uh, is the education level of the participant important in their adoption uh, reaction? We haven't looked at that yet, but we okay. did gather data on years of schooling, so that's something that we're going to look into. So for the education program, do you have this packaged in a way that other people can actually run these kinds of experiments and courses? Sort of. So we've had um, requests from other uh, people, for instance, at CMU, we have a collaborator who asked uh, if she could use this just to teach her students uh, about game theory. And we have actually uh, used the similar approach to teach high school as well as university students in LA um, about AI and game theory. So. Um, we do have a, a package that can be shared, but depending on whatever your audience is, we probably want to talk about how to tailor it to best meet their needs. Great. Thank you again. Thanks.